Hello and welcome to another hour of Backyard Farmer. I'm your host, Kim Todd. We're glad you could join us as we answer all of those landscape questions. If you'd like to submit a question or pictures for a future show, drop us an email, byf at unl.edu. Make sure you tell us as much as you can about that question. Do remember to tell us where you live. And do not forget, you can follow Backyard Farmer during the week on our social media pages, Facebook, YouTube, Twitter, and Pinterest. And as always, we're going to start with samples. And Jody, mm -hmm. this little creature's been alive for a week <clears throat> in a box. Yes. <laughs> it's so special. Um, I really wanted to bring it this week, so I don't know if I'm allowed to say names, but a specific certain NET producer saved this, caught this. Can you see it? Here, let me hold it like this. This is a giant ichneumon wasp, and it's a female, and we know that because she's got that really long ovipositor. Some people may be scared thinking it's a long stinger, but it's an ovipositor, and the difference is she's using that, or she used, will, when I let her go, use that to locate the larva of a different type of wasp that lays its eggs under bark of trees. And what she does with that ovipositor is she finds that larvae and she lays her eggs in it. So it's like the circle of life. So the horn tail wasp only lays eggs in decaying or like cut down dying trees. And then the larvae of the horn tail wasp is associated with a fungus. The fungus can be detected by this female uh, ichneumon wasp and she can locate it under the bark. And you can see it, she's about five inches long with that uh, ovipositor. These are very common throughout most of the US except for the West Coast, so we will be seeing them. There is a lot of horn tails out this year, so that's probably why you're seeing these. I just wanna tell people not to kill them because they are good. I love it, really pretty. Very cool. This looks like sprinkles that belong on donuts. Yeah, I wouldn't put this on your donuts. It <laughs> wouldn't taste good. All right, so really exciting samples. I always bring exciting samples, I'm sorry. Um, but it's something that I'm seeing a fair amount of and I just wanted to help people out a little bit. And uh, that's, I'm seeing a lot of fertilizer striping, especially in, in newer neighborhoods that are getting kind of lean right now because they have kind of poor or compacted soils. And I, what I'm seeing is that as the fertilizer companies are making smaller, um, uh, prills, smaller SGNs we call it, um, people aren't adapting. So what happens is in the old days, like even 15, 10, 15 years ago, a lot of our homeowner fertilizers are these really big ones. Uh, the, so the median size of these uh, spheres are 2.4 millimeters. We call it 240 SGN. And then over the years, we've gotten narrower and narrower. And now some of the commercially available um, fertilizers like Scott's even is a very small SGN. And so these small prills don't fly as far as the bigger prills. So when you're out fertilizing with your rotary spreader and you're used to using these big prills that might spread 15 feet, now you use this prill that only spends uh, five feet in each direction. So that leaves you a five foot gap in the middle of what mm. you use to, uh, to, to treat with. And so as you go to a smaller SGN, it means you're gonna make more passes, but it also means it's gonna be more uniform in the soil. So that's good, but you have to be a little bit tighter. So when I make my applications, I usually try to throw back to my, my, my wheel marks for my last application. And that's one way that you can try to kind of minimize that. You will get a little bit higher rate. And so usually I'll, I'll turn my setting down like just one notch. So if it said for four, I'd, do a, like a three, uh, I'd use a three. Or if it's an A, I'd say I'd be a B to make it a little bit smaller. Uh, and then I do that and it helps to minimize fertilizer striping. So kind of watch where those prills are spreading and throw it to your wheel marks. Excellent. I would not have thought of that in looking at fertilizer. So yep. it might, it's not a lame sample. It's a good one. It's, I mean, it's kind of boring, but you know, I'm hoping it helps people not stripe their lawns, right? So okay. that's all. All right, Kyle, we have iris. We do. So we have just some, uh, some iris leaf spot here. Um, and so this is a, this is a fungal pathogen caused, um, caused by a fungi in the, um, in the genus Datamella. Um, but one of the things that I, you know, we always harp about sanitation at the end of the year and making sure that we are really cleaning up our, um, our beds. And this is, this is one of the reasons. This, this disease is primary, well, it's really only, um, only spread by kind of old, um, old debris in, the, in your beds. So 
when we are at the end of the season, if we are leaving some of those dead leaves out there, we will have this fungus that, that starts to grow. And if we zoom in on some, let's see, on some of these spots right here, you can actually see that there are, uh, there are some kind of black little pimples in there, some black specks. And that's the fungus actually, actually sporulating to get ready to cause, to cause more infection. And so then it'll just, you know, those spores will blow over and they'll cause some of these smaller little yellow lesions that will eventually expand into the larger, um, the larger, more almost eye-shaped lesions. But as far as control goes for this one, again, the biggest thing you're gonna be want wanting to do is sanitation at the end of the season. The other thing is make sure that you are removing, if you have some heavily infected leaves, make sure that you're getting rid of those as, as early as you can. Um, or if it is a, if it is a planting that you're fairly, um, fairly concerned about, there are some fungicides that, that work well, but most of this can be controlled just through cultural means. Excellent. Thank you all. All right, Jody, you're up with the first round of pictures. Uh, this one is from Hartley, Iowa, which is northwest Iowa. Has a white oak and bur oak, both 10 to 15 years old. They've both got these tightly wrapped leaves Inside is sort of this white mass of something or other. Thought it was herbicide damage. Um, he said an older tree in the same area seems unaffected. And we kind of wondered about this and we think it belongs with you and we're not yeah, sure. They kind of look like galls. Um, mm -hmm. There are a lot of different galls that are on oak. So some type of oak leaf gall. There is one that they do curl and on the inside they'll have like fluffy white kind of spheres, so that might be it. Um, we do have a lot of oak problems though. Maybe Kyle knows that, but I'm, I've received a lot of oak leaves in the last week or so. Yeah, so really nothing he can do There's nothing do that you can do point. about it now, um, yeah. It San should survive. Sanitation in the fall. Yeah, sanitation in the fall. And this is, this is definitely one of those situations where having more pictures would help. And so not only uh, having a good picture of the back of the leaves would really tell us, is this, is this fungal? There is an oak leaf blister that mm -hmm. can cause similar symptoms, or is it a gall that Jody would be able to tell, you, tell us all about? All right, excellent. Okay, so uh, your next one is interesting. This is Hollyhock with two issues, and he's, uh, this is from Rising City. He's wondering about the light-colored track, and then he's wondering about what happened that caused the stem to break off. He says, we, he is following our fungicide recommendations, so he does not have Hollyhock rust, but apparently he's got everything else going on. Okay, so the light color track in the leaves, that's done by a, a leaf miner. So that's actually a fly, a female fly laid an egg between the layers of the leaf and it just, the maggot or larvae just burrows through and mines and eats and then emerges as a fly. It's merely, it's just cosmetic. The stem, that could be a stalk borer, which is a type of moth that gets into any kinds of stalk. Um, it could be like corn or milkweed, any like long stalk plant. Um, there's not really anything you can do about it at this time because the caterpillar is pretty, is probably still in there, but if you can take it and destroy it so it doesn't cr cr crawl into another stock nearby, um, that would probably be the best solution. All right, excellent. All right, Bill. Cut. In the turf world, first off, this is a very lean lawn on this first one, and then all the dog spots are green from fertilizer. He's watering to help this problem, but it seems to make it worse. He thinks the dog spot should be dead and the lawn should be green. Is yep. he right? Uh, it depends. <laughs> um, the dog spots don't always kill the grass. Uh, it depends kind of on salt and some other things in the urine that can kill the grass. But in this situation, actually the watering is probably making it even worse. Uh, in, I'm assuming uh, this is a newer looking lawn. Uh, our newer lawn. So these lawns need fertilizer in the summer. Uh, it's okay to fertilize in the summer. If you're not growing and your grass is yellow like that, it needs fertilizer or it's going to get diseases or it's going to get spots like this. So just by putting some fertilizer down, it's going to even out a lot of that lawn. And so that's really going to help. And then we only want to water when you can't stick you know, a screwdriver into the ground and we should be able to feel it. If, if you can't push something into the ground, then it's dry. But if you can feel a little bit of moisture in that surface, then you don't need to water. More water usually causes more problems than less water in lawns. All right, so what 
what formulation of fertilizer right now? You can use, um, your, the organics are great right now because the microbes are in the soil are gonna break down those organics and mineralize the fertilizer for the plant to take up. But then you can also use some of the coated products and a lot of the, the products even at big box stores, a, a, a big uh, percentage of it is coated. I actually fertilized a couple days ago and knowing it's gonna be 100 on Saturday, just watered it in. It's gonna be okay as long as you're not watering dormant turf. That's what we don't want to do. All right, excellent. And then your next set here, is um, this, which is highly yellow, and what's going on with the very highly yellow yep. turf? This is something we see a lot in bluegrasses. This is, I think, at the fair. Um, and uh, this is iron chlorosis. So if you put down fertilizer now and you don't see a response, maybe the grass continues to grow, but it's still yellow, or maybe it becomes more yellow, that's because the roots are so warm and wet. Uh, from potentially overwatering, like in that first picture, all those yellow spots are right around where irrigation heads are, that those roots can't take up iron fertilizer. And so if you want to amend that, you have to spray iron sulfate or other iron kind of fertilizer onto the leaves. You can't wash it into the soil because the roots aren't working. So it's got to go on the leaf and then that can alleviate that chlorosis, but it's only going to last for about, you know, three or three or four weeks. So you might have to make repeat applications, but generally you see it a lot in the bluegrasses during the summer heat and wet soils. Okay, so is that a good opportunity for aeration as well to open up those pores later, obviously? Yeah, you now. could, and you yeah. can do it now, but more just dialing that irrigation back, that really intensifies it. Sometimes you have to with the dry weather, but the more water we put down, the more chlorosis we see. Excellent, all right. Okay, Kyle, uh, this first one is from Scott's Bluff. All right. Sent a couple, three pictures, 20, 25 foot tall, tree healthy, no water problems, good air circulation. This is throughout all the canopy, but not every single leaf has it. Um, what do we think this is? Yeah, so I actually think that this may be um, that, that same uh, to to Phryna or oak leaf blister. Um, and so similar to, to the symptoms that we were seeing on, on, on Jody's picture, but uh, lesions or the, the blisters as they age and get older, they will turn, they will turn brown and have this, this, this necrosis that, um, that's associated with it. You know, there was some question back and forth whether or not this was anthracnose and really just based on distribution, we were thinking that it's probably most likely to Phryna. And it's a bur oak, and we've been seeing a lot of blister on bur oaks this year as well. So what does this viewer do about it? This, you know, I wouldn't do anything about it. Um, this, this fungus, it thrives when we have kind of cool, cool, wet bud break periods. And so these cooler springs, we're going to see more of this fungus. It's not going to hurt, uh, not going to harm the overall health of, health of the tree. Just really a cosmetic issue. And hopefully next year it will leaf out um, and look nice and green. All right, and then your next set of pictures is from North Platte. Two bur oaks, both same thing within the last three weeks. And this one I actually think is anthracnose um, as opposed to the oak leaf blister. And the reason I think that this one's anthracnose is that we are only seeing these lesions right along the, right along the veins. And again, with anthracnose, those veins are the first <coughs> thing to develop and the, the fungus always runs towards the leaf veins and that's where we see um, disease develop. Same thing as to Phryna, cool wet bud break period um, makes the, uh, allows the fungus more time to, to, invade the, to invade the plant. Generally, it's only a cosmetic issue. However, if you are concerned about, um, concerned about the tree, um, a protective fungicide spray early in the spring before the leaves come out can be effective. All right, excellent. You know, we regularly get questions about those shrooms popping up around the home, in the mulch, and in the turf. For our first feature tonight, Kyle's going to tell us what we're looking at and how to keep them from spoiling your landscape. One of the questions that we get throughout the season are about mushrooms and slime mold. As with all of our diseases, Mushrooms are going to be very dependent on the, the, on the environmental conditions as to whether or not they're going to, going to proliferate and come up each year. In general, mushrooms prefer periods of prolonged humid weather. And after we have maybe a week to 10 days of, the, of that conducive environmental conditions, 
then we'll actually see those fruiting bodies come up out of the ground. And those fruiting bodies are the mushrooms that we all know and love. Another type of fungus that we have in our landscapes will be slime molds. And while these are very similar to mushrooms, there are some differences. These slime molds will typically show up shortly after a rain, survive for two or three days, and then as soon as it dries out, they'll just kind of blow away in the wind. Um, one way to think about mushrooms is almost to think about a, to think about an iceberg. And so the only part of the iceberg that you're seeing is that little bit that's above the water. Same as with mushrooms. The only bit of that fungus that we're seeing is the little bit that's above the soil line. And so even if we're not seeing mushrooms in our, um, in our garden or in our landscape right now, that fungus is still alive and well in our, in our, in our soil breaking down wood and doing some of the other things that we love our decomposing fungi to do. Now, unfortunately, there are some mushrooms that are poisonous. And especially if we're dealing with little children or pets um, or other small animals in the yard. And you may want to be wondering, how, how can I best remove these mushrooms? Now, the best way to take care of mushrooms is really going to be to hand pick them or just mow over them with your, with your lawn mower. Unfortunately, fungicides tend not to work too well in controlling any sort of mushrooms. And the reason for this is that a lot of these, these mushrooms, the fungi will actually be surviving maybe six feet down in the soil profile. And it's going to be very difficult to get any of that fungicide or any of that product that far down through the soil profile. If we are looking to control these mushrooms in our yard, one of the best things that we can do is to have a nice, vigorous lawn. And what, what happens is if when we, especially when we apply fertilizer, the, the turf roots become a little bit more active and now they're going to break down any woody material in the soil much more quickly. That woody material is the same material that our mushrooms are feeding on. So if we have a vigorous, well-fertilized lawn, that should help uh, prevent any mushrooms from occurring in the future. Now, one of the other questions that we always get is, can I eat this mushroom? And unless you are 100% positive and you have a lot of experience foraging and doing mushroom identification yourself, we do not recommend you eat any mushroom that you find in the lawn. There are a lot of lookalikes that can look very similar. And so we can have poisonous mushrooms that look almost the exact same as perfectly edible mushrooms, and we don't want any mistakes to happen. Good, Kyle. Mm -hmm. Those are great points. Keep that turf growing vigorously, and do not eat any mushroom you find around your home unless you really know what you're doing, which yes. most of us don't. No. <laughs> all right, we have a lot of questions for all of you, so we're going to pile right through these. Jody, sure. your first one is North Platte. <laughs> She saw these two insects on the petunias. She thought one was a male, one was a female. Hasn't seen any more. Okay. Um, these are western leaf-footed bugs. If you can see their hind legs, they've got like big calves if they were humans. Um, and that zigzaggy on the back. In some places they may um, harm fruit, but I don't think they were doing any harm there. Just hanging out in the petunias. Just hanging out. If you think they're male and female, then maybe they were mating. <laughs> <laughs> that would happen often. All right, so your next one is from Scott's Bluff. Found this on the berry plants, and she says it has eaten some of them all the way down to the stalk. What yeah. are these? Yeah, so these are blister beetles. They are, they're bad because they bring all their friends, and they can eat really, really fast. Uh, they also can secrete um, cantharidin, which is, uh, can be poisonous if it's eaten, and also it can cause blisters on the skin. So. I would just, if you see them, pick them off with gloves, put them in soapy water. Yeah, bad yeah. guys, bad guys. All right, your, your third one is, uh, found this in a mulberry fruit. It's the size of a tick and it's pretty close to the next one, I think. This first one's North Bend and the next one's Hickman. Yeah, they're both the same. This is a nymph to a green stink bug. So those are shield bugs. Everyone knows the brown marmorade stink bug. This one's just a green stink bug. They can be crop pests in some places. I don't think they're too much of a pest in Nebraska right now, but they're, I mean, they'll get a little bit bigger like that, but then they'll be completely green with wings. If you don't want them there, you can probably pick them off. I wouldn't spend any money or 
time spraying, anything like that. All right, and your final one is, this is Denton, Nebraska, and I love this because he's got a, a uh, what he thinks is a green June beetle next to a Japanese beetle, is he right? He is right, um, and they are a lot bigger than the Japanese beetle, and everyone's seeing them, so it's a really great comparison with scale. Um, they are coming out of the ground in some places in mass. Uh, they can be a turf pest as a white grub, not too much as an adult. Sometimes they can get into fruit and decaying um, organic matter, um, but they're big enough. I would try to maybe net them or um, I wouldn't spray for them either. Um, but if you try to do that, they probably fly at you just because they're really clumsy, not because they're trying to attack you. <laughs> clumsy <laughs> clumsy. They, are, they are terrible flyers. <laughs> All right. Okay, Bill, you've got uh, five, too, that are, they're actually diseased pretty much, Kyle, but your disease plate is pretty full. All right. <laughs> so, okay, the first one here, uh, what is this? Yep, uh, it looks like tall fescue lawn. Um, it, could be either dollar spot or pythium blight. Um, I'm thinking it's pythium blight um, from another picture that I saw of it. I mean, a dollar spot based on what the leaves look like. It's a foliar pathogen, uh, not to worry about it. We've had very high dollar spot pressure uh, the last couple of weeks. All right, your second one, uh, she calls it frog eyes. Yeah, this could either be summer patch or necrotic ring spot. Those are two kind of lawn diseases. Um, unfortunately, there's not a lot you can do now uh, for them. Um, the DMI type fungicides for summer patch might provide a little bit relief in season. Um, if it is necrotic ring spot, you'd actually want to intercede with like tall fescue because the bluegrass is getting affected and uh, send a sample and maybe something Kyle could tell you which one that actually is. Which you can't do right now. We can't do. Yeah, there, there's Sorry. no way to differentiate <laughs> Never mind. these two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, and she did say something about an, uh, treating with an infused granular on this one. Yeah, with, if, for these root diseases, you actually treat when the soils are wet and cool at like 60 to 65 degrees. Ooh. And so we're dealing with the damage from the spring and with the cool, wet spring, we see a lot of root diseases on all of our turf grass from putting greens to lawns. All right, your next one is in Kearney. Uh, brown spots like this in, in the turf. Yeah, it's hard to see from this vantage point. Most likely that's just gonna be um, brown patch, uh, the one of the most common lawn diseases we are seeing right now. Um, the lawn looks, you know, it's not super green. It may be a little bit lean. Um, could be a little bit low if you're compacted, walking between there and the shed. Uh, so those things would make it more susceptible to this disease, but it's ultimately, again, a foliar, non-lethal disease that will go away. It just might look a little goofy for a little All bit. All right, and your next one is also carny, and this is just the close-up. Yep. What is this? So these are what brown patch looks like on the leaf. You can see by the irregular margins, the kind of purplish color that's gonna grow as those lesions grow. And so this is one of the ways we can tell if it's dollar spot, they're, they're more of a girdle leaf, uh, kind of like an hourglass shape. And so that's one of the things you can look at to differentiate the two. Pythium blight, the first one I mentioned, you'll see a lot of thick cottony mycelium and it will kill the grass in a matter of days. So if that happens, you had pythium blight, you have to stop watering so much. All right, and you have a final one from Creston in Nebraska. Uh, this is a new build and it's getting worse. So. Yeah, I think that's what this is too. The some of the lesions look a little bit like it. It could be um, some pythium bite again. I have pythium bite does happen on tall fescue, and if you are over watering a new construction, new sod, it, it could pop up. Um, but it'd be something you probably want to need to kind of be lab confirmed. So if it's pythium blight, just back that water down, um, especially if it's rooted already. Uh, and if it is brown patch, it's just gonna mow off eventually with some change in the weather. So that was like a pseudo lightning round, I feel like. <laughs> and so is Kyle's. <laughs> yeah. Lots of pictures yeah. this week, which we really appreciate. All right, Kyle, your first one here. Uh, this is Lincoln. She's wondering why her tomatoes look like this. Yeah, not. Not 100% sure. We've been getting a lot of calls about curly tomatoes, and we did have some thought about, uh, there are some viruses, um, and so there's a beet curly top virus that um, infects tomatoes. However, curly top tends to have the leaves curl up, and all of these leaves are curled down. In general, when leaves are curled down like that, we tend to think herbicide issues. And so I don't know about a growth regulator herbicide, um, if there is any, any 2,4-D or dicamba that, that may have been applied in that area. Regardless, um, if it was a virus or herbicide injury, we probably don't want to be eating that fruit because it won't ripen. Um, if it's a virus, it won't ripen correctly. And if it's a herbicide issue, we can't recommend eating herbicide-drifted fruit. 
All right, and then you have a, quite a handful of cucumber questions. Uh, the first one here, this is Gretna. She sent in a couple pictures, uh, healthy and thriving, very tiny black patches, brown patches, no insects, but she's still getting nice cukes. Yeah, so I think this one might be uh, might be the start of downy mildew, is, is my thought with the, we have a um, little bit of mycelial growth on the leaf here, and then those smaller angular white, white lesions. Best way to deal with downy mildew in any of your cucurbits is going to be um, through, through properly spacing, but also resistant varieties. We do have a lot of resistant varieties out there. That will always be your first choice when, when trying to manage this, this disease. All right, and your next cuke one is, uh, these are grown in straw bale garden. Fruits have these uh, irregularly shaped dried scabs on them and she tries to stay organic. So I think that this is angular leaf spot and so this is actually caused by a bacterial pathogen. Um, the bacterium, is, it does better in some, in some cooler temperatures and so depending on, where, where, where is this one from? Uh, this one is Lincoln. Lincoln, okay. Mm -hmm. um, but, well, yeah, so angular leaf spot most likely, um, bacterial disease that will cause some kind of scabby lesions on, on, the, on the fruit. Typically not a whole lot to do as far as control for, as far as control for this one, um, but copper products before the onset of, of heavy disease can help, um, can help push it back a little bit. All right, and your final cuke one, this is Hastings, and uh, these are grown in buckets and they're turning yellow. I think the problem here might be lack of holes in the bottom of the bucket. <laughs> um, it's ge general yellowing like this makes me think of overwatering or just some environmental condition, and especially in plastic. Um, it's a rough environment for these cucumbers to be growing. All right, excellent. Now that our garden is up and growing, we're going to start talking a little bit about making plans for your fall harvest. Here to tell us about what's going on in the backyard farmer garden is Terry James. This week in the Backyard Farmer Garden, we're beginning to look at what we're going to do for our fall crops. One of them is going to be a new All-America Selection winner pea called Snack Hero. This is a new pea that's coming out. It's a four inch long pod that's supposed to be pretty succulent, um, but has a really um, snappy texture and taste to it. It's going to take full sun. It's going to like those cool season crops, so it's going to get started really quickly in our really warm summer soils and then take us into the fall. It's going to be a bush type, so it's not going to get too terribly tall. So those of you that are in an urban environment with some containers, you can try this one. The plant height's going to be 18 to 24 inches tall, and it's going to have about four inch long pods on it. So stop by the Backyard Farmer Garden this fall and check out our new All-America Selection Pea Snack Hero. Right now it is time for lightning. All right, Kyle, you ready? Always. <laughs> we have a viewer who has asked us uh, whether you should use neem oil on diseases. Uh, no. <laughs> we also have a viewer who says they've done a lot of research into what to do for powdery mildew on their roses and they want to know about baking soda. Um, don't use it. Um, baking soda, there's a lot of research out there talking about baking soda controlling all sorts of things. A lot of that research has not been reproduced or even done in a great way. So I would not, not use baking soda. All right, uh, speaking of beet curly top, we have a viewer who wants to know whether this is a new virus for us. Nope, it's, uh, it's been around for, for quite a while. All right, and their second question is, do they need to worry about it for next year? Um, generally, yes, you would. It is a, it is a virus that will be, um, it, can, can be, it can stay in any weedy, some weedy hosts, and so you'll want to uh, make sure to remove any ec extra weeds from the garden, too. All right, uh, we have a viewer who dug out a knockout rose with a virus. Can he replant in the same space? I would not. I'd, uh, want, I'd want to move to at least at least a few feet away. You've probably left some root particles in there, and those root particles will have the virus as well. Excellent. Thank you so much. You ready, Bill? Yep. <laughs> this is a viewer in Ord who says, if I water in the hot middle of the day, will I scorch the grass? Uh, don't. Just don't do it. 
Uh, it doesn't cool the grass off anymore. Um, it's just not recommended. Water in the morning, unless you see wilt. If it's wilting in the middle of the day, turn the water on. But if you don't see wilting grass, water in the mornings for a lot of reasons. All right, this is an Underwood, Iowa viewer who has uh, yellowing lawns with irrigation and is wondering about fertilizing. Yeah, this is the time to fertilize. If you're not growing an inch and a half of new growth a week, your lawn is lean and it could actually benefit from fertilizing. All right, this is a Kearney viewer who uh, wants to use a crabgrass control with quinclorac in it, says only below 85 degrees. He wonders if he can push that to below 90. It's gonna get hot. I mean, you wanna stay with what the label says. If the label says 85, you should really stay to what that label says. It's the law. All right, uh, what is the waiting period between plants that have been killed by 2,4-D and replanting in the same spot? Uh, it's pretty short. Um, the label, again, will give you some guidance there, but you're looking at um, generally like a week or so. Right. Same thing with Roundup, too. Roundup doesn't get absorbed by the seed, so you can round up and have seed in the ground and it won't hurt the seed. Excellent, thank you so much. All right, Jody, are you ready? I'm never ready. <laughs> <laughs> one, of our, uh, one of our pictures in beauty was of a cicada, and the question is, what was that? Okay. And will they be in Omaha? Okay, so that was a periodical <laughs> cicada. That's why we're surprised to see it. Oh wait, we're in a lightning round. They shouldn't be in Omaha, because that's, our brood is brood four, and we were the periodical cicada in 2015, so we're not due to have them until 2032. Okay, we have a viewer who wants to know uh, where do trees that have emerald ash borer end up after they're being removed? Um, they can be burned where they are and sometimes people are making them into beautiful furniture. All right, uh, we have uh, an old bottle of seven that showed carbaryl as the active ingredient. The new one is zeta cypermethrin, is that correct? Um, yeah, there's actually, the under the label seven, the brand seven, there are a lot of different active ingredients. That's why you do need to read the label in carbaryl and the zeta cypermethrin. Those are two different classes of, of insecticides. All right, is it too late to treat for bagworms if they're already in their bags? Um, you can still treat. You're just gonna wanna use probably something a little more conventional, so um, pyrethroids. Okay, excellent, nice job all. Kyle, do you want to do plant of the week? I'm happy to. <laughs> You're going to make stuff up or what? Got, got a nice purple purple dog tail. <laughs> <laughs> or <laughs> how do I follow that one? Yeah. <laughs> On the other hand, we have liatris uh, or gay feather is what a lot of people call it or blazing star is another name for it. We have multiple uh, different species in our rain garden in the backyard farmer garden. The beauty of them is they bloom from the top down, so they bloom for a very long time and the pollinators adore them. And then this, uh, this white thing that would remind a lot of you of either a hollyhock or a, um, a hibiscus is in fact shrub althea or Rose of Sharon, which is the one that is the woody shrub supposedly. Uh, oftentimes in Nebraska, it chooses to forget that it is supposed to live through the winter and it has a lot of dieback. But typically comes in different colors. A pink, there's a pink one, there's a blue one, and there's a white one, and a pretty nice, interesting plant blooming right now. So there we go, plants of the week. Picture questions next. All right, Jody, your next picture is, uh, let's see, this one is from Omaha. The question is, can you identify this tiny caterpillar? They've eaten through about all of her buttercup leaves. Okay, so this caterpillar is not a caterpillar. It is a sawfly larvae, so it's got like just too many legs to be a caterpillar. But um, these things will fall off the plant and hide, um, and they will eat a lot because there are usually a lot of them. So what you can do is try to pick them off or put like a tray underneath and then scare them and they'll all fall in there. Um, if you do want to spray something, I would probably do maybe spinosad since it's a birational and won't kill any of your pollinators. All right, and your next one is, what is happening to my tomatoes? Okay, so this is kind of interesting because I'd, I'd like to see some frass uh, to, to see if it's a caterpillar that's been eating that. I don't see any like emergence holes or holes in there or frass or poop around there, so I'm not sure. Does that look familiar to you? Um, not entirely no but there are we've talked about tomato viruses earlier and there are some viruses that will kind of cause some fruit 
uh, some di mi some misshapen fruit and some discoloration like that as well. Yeah. So yeah, and there are definitely. some caterpillars that will go into tomato, and I think we've got right. Your next one, I think, is uh, so maybe he'll send us another picture right. of the whole plant. Yeah. So okay. this one is uh, this is a firth viewer. Yeah, so this one looks like a bug. So this, um, <laughs> I mean, we we do have tomato hornworm, but this looks more like tomato fruit worm, which is also corn earworm, uh, a, a pest of corn. Same pest, but you can see like the holes through the tomato and the fruit and it looks like some frass in there. So normally insects will leave like feeding damage, emergence or exit holes and poop. So that's how you'll know. There's not really anything you can do for that tomato, but I would scout early for any other caterpillars that you may be seeing and pick them off. Excellent. All right, Bill, um, again, <laughs> disease. <Okay. laughs> this is a gearing viewer. Uh, large areas of her yard, last year she had two, this year they're back and she has more of these areas. Yeah, this one's a little bit harder to see without having the good leaf lesions. Um, if it is widespread like this, uh, it could be some kind of a, of a dollar spot. Um, it, you could also look to see if there's any kind of insect feeding, maybe. It may be a little early for that. Um, uh, especially some kind of piercing, suckling, sucking type uh, insects. Um, so a little bit better picture would be something to kind of shoot for with that one. But if it is overwatering, that is going to help. If it is a disease, uh, make that become more problematic and widespread. All right. Uh, and your next one is uh, she says she has a severe patch of uh, brown patch. She wants to use a natural remedy, neem, baking soda. Yes. Yeah, so this, this is a more classic look of uh, what um, dollar spot looks like. Again, our dollar spot models are up at about 70% risk, which is super high. So we're really seeing it widespread, even on our trials on East Campus where we have dozens of different grasses. Some of them are all brown patch, I mean dollar spot. Uh, you could treat this with a lot of the different things um, at uh, fungicides at um, garden centers and home stores. Uh, it will help it recover, but then you need some growth too, some fertilizer to mow off that dead tissue for it to go back to becoming green. So it is definitely a slow growing disease that is gonna be lingering more when the grass is growing slower. All right, and your third one, same tune, different verse. <sighs> there could be a lot of things of this. Um, it, it's just, it, 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 this is like having a sneeze and trying to figure out what's the underlying issue. I see a lot of really thin, unhealthy grass there. And uh, so we'd probably need to look a lot closer at leaves and you know get a better description of what's going on with the soil moisture and uh, some of those other things. Because it probably is a continuum of all of them, honestly, that we need to just think about good management to, uh, to handle this stress, so. All right, thank you. All right, Kyle, um, this is a beautiful looking tomato. Uh, and then they cut it open. Oh, even more beautiful. <laughs> With a happy face. <laughs> yeah, um, this, this one was kind of interesting, but I kind of wondered if maybe Jody should have had this one as well. But I th think what happened with this was that there were some fruit cracks that developed. And so cracks will develop when, when the fruit is growing too rapidly and the skin can't keep up. But then when the, when the skin on the fruit cracks, then moisture is able to get into the to get into the fruit as well, um, and so I kind of think that's what's that's what's going on here. Is we had some some moisture that got into the fruit, and then we have some fungi or bacteria that were able to take advantage of that of that sugar and caused this mess. Right, I would not eat that tomato. <laughs> we have another viewer. Your second picture here is one that has scab on his potatoes. He had the same problem with sweet potatoes last year, and this is Plymouth, Nebraska. Yep, and so scab, uh, scab is very common in, in a lot of potato production fields. Um, it's caused by a bacterial disease, um, so Streptomyces scabies is the, the name of that disease. But it's much more, much more prevalent in fields, where, um, in areas where we're not doing crop rotation. And so if you did have potatoes in there last year, it makes sense that we would have a buildup of inoculum this year. Um, as far as, you know, right now, there's not, not a whole lot that can be done, but anything that we can do to, to minimize um, wounding, to the, um, wounding to the potatoes. And also, the other thing that really helps decrease scab is having high soil moisture um, at, as those tubers are growing. And so making sure that the moist soil moisture is high can decrease scab, but that can also increase some other diseases. So. <laughs> Scab's really a tough one to deal with. All right, thank you, Kyle. And your third one here is, uh, this is a Midtown uh, Omaha viewer. 
She's growing zucchini in too small of a space. She got one yesterday, but it looked like this. She's wondering, she, should she sacrifice the zucchini because it's taking over her tomato plants? I would sacrifice this fruit. This is our, our good friend, Blossom Endrot. Um, it's fine, starting to show up. And this is, Blossom Endrot is caused by a calcium deficiency. Um, and, but it's typically our soils tend not to be deficient in calcium but we're not doing the consistent watering that's needed for that calcium to be uptaken by the fruit. Um, so really just uh, consistent watering during fruit set and that should take care of blossom end rot for you. All right, excellent. Well, unfortunately the pandemic has hit just about everything in our lives pretty hard. That is also true of those in the business of producing the plants that we all find at the garden centers. We took our cameras out to Bluebird Nursery in Clarkson to see how they dealt with the crisis and what they're looking forward to this fall and next spring. Our spring we thought was gonna start out normal as usual, but um, as uh, the COVID started spreading more, uh, we saw orders being canceled. So we got a little nervous, but as time continued to go on, um, the orders started to pick back up because people wanted to get out in their gardens, plant up some beautiful succulents that we have and uh, make their house beautiful if it was still too cold to go out or start putting stuff in their gardens outside. Actually, we're kind of used to the use the large rush because um, we uh, that's what we live for working here. I mean, our springtime is our money making time. And so we we go with the flow. We just everybody works together and um, we get the job done. This is such a small, small business, but with a big heart feel. Um, I was very lucky that we as Bluebird employees got to continue to go to work every day while other people were told to stay home, can't go to work. Um, and it's therapeutic and you know, we are a small group, so it was a safe zone. We all know each other, you know, we all felt like we were in a little bubble. Um, so we just continued to stay busy and keep production going all the time because we we knew no matter what, people are gonna to wanna to come around and get plants. And so that's basically, people need plants to keep them happy, so. Well, of course we had a few of them that are, were concerned about the, um, the situation and um, we really didn't stop working. Um, everybody still continued to come into work. Uh, those that wanted to social distance or you know, keep their distance from others. They, you know, walked around with Lysol cans or whatever they needed to do to, you know, help themselves. But overall, everybody came to work and, and we just did our thing. That family owned business is a major player in the horticulture world and we are really fortunate to have it so close to us here in Nebraska. Stay tuned to Backyard Farmer in coming weeks as we'll hear some other great stories coming out of Bluebird Nursery. All right, Jody. you've got four insects this time around. Uh, <laughs> this first one is a Ralston viewer. She's noticed this on her winged euonymus or burning bush. What is this? She's got spider mites. And so this is when it's like hot and humid and it seems kind of far along. So probably next year, you want to um, put like a white sheet under there and, or a sheet of paper and tap. And if you see the mites falling down, that's when you want to treat. Um, I, don't, I don't know if it's possible to treat right now. You can do, um, there's some birationals, but you may, if you want to, and I don't know how, again, how, how bad it is, there's miticides that sh they can try to use, but I would just be more prepared next year and really water it, um, water that plant. All right, your second one, um, this, suppo this happened over no more than two days. All of the lettuce in the gardens suddenly developed this. They thought it was herbicide. Some cucumber plants got it, but nowhere as bad as this. He thinks it's a pathogen or an insect in the lettuce. I've never seen <laughs> lettuce look that non -green. Tasty. Yeah, and <laughs> I mean, I've seen some aphids and things on, on lettuce, but for, for two days, I'm not really sure. Uh, I mean, it doesn't look chewed, so it would be like a sucking yeah. pest, but I don't know, pathologist. Yeah. 
Uh, I, um, I mean, t when we have the entire top that dies, I go always look at look into the root zone, and so you know, it's maybe some sort of root rot, but. That's really fast to yeah. see that and all their amount lives. of, yes. Yeah. yeah, and if it's all of them, I would still probably go back to that herbicide question. Yeah. Maybe, yep. All right, so your next one, Jody, is uh, this is a honey locust, and these webbed leaves cover about 15% of the tree. Yeah, we are seeing a lot of this right now. Uh, this is mimosa webworm. So there are little caterpillars, a lot of them in that webbing. So they feed on the leaves in between there. Um, it's really hard to treat them and usually it's just cosmetic, uh, but there are like two generations per year. If you were to spray like BT up there, I just really don't even know if it could break through all that silk. So if you can, if you can reach them and prune them out, I would prune them out. Um, and if, if they're still young, you can probably spray, but a lot of times these locust trees are like so tall, right. you don't want to spray yourself. Right. So Your next one is Carney, and they found this dried grass, grasshoppers, pupae, and all sorts of things accumulating in their window tracks. What is this? Okay, this is like the coolest sample of the whole <laughs> set. So this, <laughs> these are pupil, or no, actually no. So. This is done by, it's called a grass carrying wasp. So sometimes you see, you know, wasps make things out of mud and make things out of paper. They make their nests for their, well, their solitary, um, for their young out of grass and they prey on tree crickets. So that's why there's tree crickets at the bottom and she laid eggs for her larvae to eat the tree crickets, but now that's not gonna happen. But I think that was part of a house. Mm -hmm. So they nest in these like hollow cavities, like tubes, but they will also nest in urban areas along the tracks of your window mm -hmm. and high up, like it's, it's interesting. Jonathan Larson had that in his house. It was the coolest thing. <laughs> <laughs> All right. All right, Bill, your first question here is, uh, this is um, two trees removed and this weed is starting to grow everywhere and she sent I think a closer up of one yeah. of them too. What is this? It looks, it looks like a lawn, a lawn of crabgrass. Sure does. Um, yep. So um, honestly with that much of it there, if you're, I'm guessing there is bare soil. So in this scenario, I would probably not even mess around with selective control and just go non-selective and try to knock it back before it makes a lot of seed if it's not doing so already. Keep it mowed. Uh, try to keep it clean and then we're entering our grass growing window. So if you do want to put a grass there, uh, you know, we're only a couple weeks away, honestly, from starting to get grass seed in the ground in early to mid August. Uh, and so I would try to get this cleaned up now with multiple applications of a non-selective and then get ready to seed uh, or sod. All right, excellent. Or mulch. Or mulch or yeah. something. Or something. Right, yeah, or mow the crabgrass. <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right, so uh, your next one here, this is a Gretna viewer. He thought it was yellow nut sedge. He used uh, sulfentrazone on it. Uh, seed head looks affected, spreads with rhizomes, and then he wondered if it is yellow nut sedge. Yes, yeah, so that's windmill grass uh, on the bottom. I th it's hard to say on the top. It still looks kind of triangular on that top one. I'm assuming it's the same, but that seed head is a dead giveaway. Right. Um, if you're trying to control this one, there's really three herbicides at K-State. Um, Jared Hoyle was there. He did a bunch of research. Uh, he found that um, a claim works, but then the newer products that can work even a little better would be like uh, Pylex or multiple applications of Tenacity. And actually, if you uh, mix those with, um, oh, uh, blanking on the, the herbicide right now, those will work if you mix them with. Uh, Something else. The herbicide I usually always recommend for uh, woody weeds, uh, Triclopure. You will get better control. <laughs> so it's kind of weird. It's mainly for broadleafs, but it does a good job of killing that, that windmill grass too. So uh, that would be your option for those if you're looking for selective control. Is windmill grass perennial? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. All right. Okay, Kyle, um, this is a viewer here in Lincoln. She, she says this is the first time she's had this on a plant or any plant. Part sun, morning, east side of the house, and this is one of our big sedums, obviously. Um, yeah, I, not entirely, I mean, some sort of sedum, sedum leaf spot. It does look fungal to me as well. Um, there are, there's a few different fungi that can all, form, all cause different sedum leaf spots. It doesn't really matter which one of those fungi it is, but control is really all going to be the same for, for them. And so the big thing is going to be making sure that we're watering from the base of the plant 
so we're not doing that overhead irrigation that would splash any of those spores up. Um, the, and then also just spacing. I know sedums will grow kind of tight, so getting airflow through there can be a little bit difficult, but anything you can do to increase airflow through there should, should help decrease those spots. And they do not like water. No. So, all right, and your next one here, this is a hibiscus. Ready to bloom finally. We have had several people send in pictures of these spots on hibiscus. Lots of buds, many of the leaves look like this. She said she used fungonil on it, but not to apply it when the plant is blooming. So what, have, what are we going with here? So I actually don't know if fungonil would work on, on this. I think that this is a bacterial leaf spot. Um, their lesions are, they're pretty small and kind of sunken, and they seem to be vein restricted as well, which we tend to see a lot more with our bacterial diseases. So I don't think fungonil would be, would be an option, or I don't think fungonil would control this. If it is bacterial, not a whole lot of great options as far as controlling our bacterial diseases, aside from really just moisture management. Um, and I do know that with hibiscus and some of our copper products, especially if applied um, early on, they, they should provide some control too. All right, excellent. Well, of course, we have announcements of a handful of things that are going on in the gardening world, and our first one is really fun. This is uh, Daylily Days at Harmony Nursery, Monday to Friday, 9 to 5.30, Saturday, 9 to 3. Free event in Benedict, Nebraska. And if anybody has daylilies, of course, right now, they're in their full glory. Our second is our Grow Big Red virtual learning series has started. You can register at the URL on your screen. It's every Tuesday through September. I know uh, several of you participated and there were a lot of good questions answered. And I think we have a third one and that of course is us. Digging Deeper with Backyard Farmer. You can watch us on Facebook Thursdays at 8 p.m. right after our show. You can follow us on Backyard Farmer in NET Nebraska and that's always uh, really an interesting, great time. All right, we have just a little bit of time for additional questions that you have not seen. So <laughs> this is always fun. Um, Jody, we have a lot of people commenting on, they see little brown insects with white fluff or they see uh -huh. white fluff. And yeah, like the woolly aphids. Just and you flick it. And floating it, around. Yeah, what it, that is. They're just woolly aphids. They're um, on like the maple trees. Yeah. They're the ones we had in the courtyard that one year. Right, and what do you do about them? Do they, are they harmful? That's the question. Just enjoy them. They're like little fairies in the sky. Um, when they're on the plant, when they're on the plant, they are sap suckers and they'll drop honeydew and it's a problem. And you'll probably want to hose them down with the, mm -hmm. with the, with the hose. But if they're floating around in the air, I don't know. Just go <laughs> Enjoy show them. somebody. Tell somebody about them. That's a little bug. All right. <laughs> so helpful. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Bill. So you mentioned that we're a couple weeks away from the seeding window. Yeah. And that is seeding for all of our turf species. Our cool or season species. Cool season yeah, species. Yeah, the warm seasons like your buffalo grass and zoysia, we seed in the spring, um, or we can dormant seed at the end of the season, and they overwinter and then they pop up earlier in the spring. But if you're doing a new lawn to tall fescue or Kentucky bluegrass, which are primary uh, lawns in Nebraska, that would be happening uh, in about mid-August. So if you have those areas, get ready, start killing them off. If you have weeds there, a couple of applications, so you can have a nice clean seed bed, so you're ready to go. Because a lot of times it sneaks up on us, the next thing you know it's September. <laughs> well, and we did have a couple of people ask us about controlling Creeping Charlie or Violets before they seed. Can't really do that. If it's non-selective, you might have a better control option. Okay. So you probably can get some control with multiple applications. So really get that seed bed ready and clean now so that when you're ready to seed in a couple of weeks, you're good to go. All right. Kyle, we had a, this is a quick one. We had somebody who had a butterfly bush and lost a couple of the stems on it, thinks it's a root rot. Do they need to, what, dig that up and get rid of it? Or? Uh, the main thing that I would do is just um, just cut, hold back on the watering this year. It's um, hopefully, if it's only been a couple of stems, stems that you've lost, it's still an overall overall healthy root system. Cut back on the water this year and then hope that next year it comes back um, better than ever.